And uh, our next speaker is Russ Epstein from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, his title is Anchoring the Cognitive Map, Neural Mechanisms for Landmark-Based Navigation. All right, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I feel a little bad, I don't have a crazy revolutionary theory, just a you know, standard cognitive neuroscience, but hopefully you'll find it uh, interesting. Um, okay, so uh, all mobile organisms must solve the problem of navigation. Uh, so uh, say, for example, I were in my office in Goddard Hall on the University of Pennsylvania campus and wanted to get somewhere else, like the bookstore. So how do I plan a route to get to be there efficiently uh, rather than wandering around randomly? Um, well, it's been appreciated for some time that there's more than one way to solve this problem. So if I've been between these two locations many times before, uh, then I can use what's uh, known as the taxon or response-based strategy, and that is I can simply implement a series of actions that I know from experience will get me from one place to another. Um, now, to use this kind of strategy, I don't actually need to know where anything is in space. All I need to know is this sequence of actions. Um, another type of strategy is to use knowledge about where things are in space to plan a route. Um, so this is known as a uh, cognitive map, or sometimes referred to as a locale uh, strategy. Um, to use this strategy, I need to have some way of assigning coordinates to the environment, so quantities, as Randy was uh, talking about. Um, I can then define uh, locations on this grid, um, including my current location and my goal, and uh, route planning then turns into an abstract problem of vector calculation. Uh, knowing that I'm here and I want to get here, I can simply choose a bearing that takes me more or less directly to my goal. Um, now we know from electrophysiological studies that there are cells in the rodent brain that seem to be useful for cognitive map-based navigation. So most famously, in 1971, O'Keefe and Dostrovsky uh, discovered cells in the uh, rat hippocampus that fire as a function of the location of the animal. Uh, they labeled these cells play cells because the firing of one of these cells indicates uh, that the animal is in a particular place. Um, in, in a book published in 1978, O'Keefe and Linda Dow hypothesized that these play cells were the neural instantiation of the cognitive map. This is probably familiar to many of you. Um, and of course, now we know that in addition to uh, play cells that fire in uh, a single location, there are other varieties of cells in the broader hippocampal formation that might be useful for this cognitive map based navigation. So, um, we now know that there are grid cells that fire not in a single location, but in a regular array of locations that make up a triangular lattice, um, and also head direction cells whose firing uh, is not dependent on the location of the animal, but the uh, heading, the direction that the animal is facing in space, sort of like a neural compass. So together, these cells allow the animal to represent its current position and uh, heading, and our recent work suggests that they allow you to uh, potentially uh, plan a route to another location, just as one could do with a, a real physical map. Okay. All right, so that's the introduction. That's all well and good, um, probably familiar to many of you. Um, but what I'm going to focus on today is the fact that in, even if you have a cognitive map in your brain, um, say this rodent here has a cognitive map of the pink campus in his brain, uh, in order to use the map, uh, you need to first know where you are in the map and which direction you're facing. So um, you need to be able to look out at the environment and say, hey, because I'm seeing this view, I must be here on the map um, and facing this direction. So the term that I will use for this ability is landmark-based navigation, which I'll define here as the use of perceptible features of the world to determine one's location and orientation on a cognitive map. Um, and what I want to do in this talk is tell you a little bit about the cognitive and neural uh, mechanisms that underlie landmark-based navigation. I'm going to uh, use data from both uh, rodents and humans. Um, and in particular, um, this talk has four parts. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about how we uh, use environmental features to align our cognitive maps to the world, so recover our um, heading uh, when we're disoriented. Uh, second, um, how as a crucial part in performing that operation, we need to establish a reference frame that's aligned to the local structure or geometry of the scene. Um, 
Third, um, I'm going to talk about how we perceive the spatial structure of the local scene. So sort of going back from, this is sort of a progression back from the map into the visual system. Uh, finally, at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about what cognitive maps are anyway. Okay. Uh, and before I get into details, I have to acknowledge, uh, you know, the people who did most of the work. Um, so the first section, uh, my former graduate students, Josh Julian and Alex Kynat, and my collaborator, Isabel Muzio. Uh, the second section, Section, my former postdoc Steve Marchetti and graduate student Lindsay Bass, and the third section is all going to be my current postdoc Nick Bonner. That's all his work. Okay. okay, so let's start with the first bit. Um, how do we align our cognitive maps to the world? So when Mickey is looking out at the world, how does he understand the relationship between uh, the coordinate axes of this internal map and the uh, axis of his geocentric <coughs> axis of his body? Um, well, um, in order to solve this problem, it would be useful to pay attention to features of the world that are fixed to the terrestrial surface, perhaps, um, or even the terrestrial surface itself. And indeed, uh, Randy uh, has argued um, that the geometric structure of the environment, uh, the lay of the land, if you will, um, is a key orientational cue. Um, and this is in part because of its uh, durability. So, very nice quote in, from this 1990 book. Randy wrote, uh, What does not change, barring a rare catastrophe like the eruption of Mount St. Helena, is the macroscopic shape of an animal's environment. A tree may fall or a boulder may tumble down, but none of these minor events alters the overall shape of the environment. So the idea here is that like this pastoral scene here might look very different in the winter with snow on the ground, um, but the slope of the ground and the arrangement of the hills will be unchanged, so that might be something that's useful to pay attention to uh, when orienting yourself. Um, similarly, um, this uh, indoor scene here, like this room is clearly seeing better days, right? Um, but although, you know, the wallpaper and the carpeting are probably changed from its glory years, the arrangement of the walls, the windows, and the doors is no, no doubt unchanged. Okay. So the geometry environment uh, might be a, a critical uh, orientational cue. Um, and Randy based his ideas um, not just on you know, thinking about it, um, but on empirical data that he and Ken Chang collected at the University of Pennsylvania uh, back in the 1980s. Um, so in the classic uh, paradigm, or now classic paradigm, uh, they would teach a rodent um, that there was a reward to be found um, by digging in one corner of a rectangular chamber, and they found that if you then removed the rodent from the chamber, disoriented it, placed it back in the chamber facing a random direction, that you would see this very interesting behavior, which is that uh, the animal would uh, often you know, search for the reward after that in the correct location, but not equally often would go to the diagonally opposite uh, location to search for the reward. Um, and that's interesting because these two locations are kind of equivalent with regard to the geometry of the room. In this case, you could say, oh, these uh, both have the long wall to the right. Um, and the animals would exhibit this behavior even if there was a uh, non-geometric cue, uh, like for example, a striping along one wall, very salient non-geometric cue, which in theory should disambiguate these two corners, but the animals didn't seem to use that non-geometric cue. They seemed to reorient primarily on the basis of the shape of the chamber. Um, and this uh, behavior has been observed in uh, many different species uh, since then, uh, including uh, human infants. Um, and I'll mention that a debate has raged about the uh, interpretation of these results. So. Uh, Randy and Ken originally um, interpreted this as uh, evidence for an informationally encapsulated geometric module uh, in the rodent brain. Uh, others disagree with the uh, modularity claim, um, but for my purposes, um, I don't need to resolve this debate. Um, I simply need to note that uh, you know, these data indicate that the shape of the environment, the geometry of the environment, is a very important cue for spatial reorientation. Um, and that's a claim that I think all researchers agree on. All right, so uh, here's just an example. Uh, this is uh, from recent data that my collaborator is about Museo and I uh, collected in mice. Uh, so see, here you can actually see our chamber. You can see the little guy down here. You can see the four sandboxes uh, that they can search for a reward. Um, and this is uh, data averaged over many different trials. Uh, and you can see that the animal often searches in the correct location, but uh, almost equally often searches in the diagonally opposite location and rarely goes to the two geometrically uh, inappropriate corners. Okay, so we thought, well, this is pretty interesting behavior, um, and uh, we wanted to know what was happening in the brain. Uh, in particular, uh, what happens in that 
a hippocampal a map instantiated by uh, place cells. Um, surprisingly, uh, no one's really uh, looked at it uh, directly. Uh, so we recorded um, from place cells in the mice um, while they were um, on, this, on the sequence of trials in which they were disoriented before each trial and then placed back in the chamber. Um, and, you know, the distal cues are masked, the sounds are masked, we clean out the chamber between each trial. So every time the animal is placed back in the chamber, uh, the only cues it can use to uh, reorient itself are basically things it can see in the chamber. Um, so we reasoned that geometry is being able to is being used to align the cognitive map, uh, and then we should see some evidence of this in the hippocampal place cell. And indeed, this is what we saw. So here's data from a single cell on uh, eight different trials. Um, and what I think you can see here, so the color indicates you know, where in the chamber the cell fires, um, is that there are basically two uh, firing locations for this uh, cell. Um, one uh, in the top right, and uh, another which is a 180 degree a rotation of the cell, of the field. Um, uh, so we're sort of seeing this uh, sort of uh, response to the geometric ambiguity. Um, and this is not just a, a property of individual place cells. If you record uh, from multiple place cells um, at the same time, you see that when one place cell uh, changes its field location, uh, rotates 180 degrees, uh, that the other cell, even though it has a different place field, will also rotate uh, in unison. So it's it's, it's as if there's a hippocampal map for this environment, which picks one of two possible alignments when the animal is uh, placed back in the chamber based on the geometry of the chamber. Um, and to really show, um, oh, and I should mention that you know there is a non-geometric cue here um, that you know could be used to control the place cell, uh, but it seems in geometry that controls the uh, alignment of the place of the field. Um, and to really show that uh, these cells are controlled by geometry, uh, we also looked at place field responses in two other shape, uh, two other chambers, the square chamber and the triangular in the chamber. Uh, so the rectangle had, uh, you know, it had uh, two-fold symmetry. Uh, the square has four-fold symmetry. Um, and consistent with that, um, you know, if you disorient the animal between each trial, you can see that they're, you put it back in, that there are four possible place field locations consistent with the four-fold uh, symmetry. Uh, for each place cell. Uh, and the triangle has no rotational <laughs> symmetries, um, and consistent with that, every time you put the uh, animal back in the chamber, a uh, uh, place field will, uh, that's in one location will continue to fire in that location because there's no rotational symmetry. Um, now, another thing we can do is examine the relationship between the place field uh, locations, the alignment of the hippocampal map, and the behavior of the animal. Um, so the data I just showed you, the animals were actually just free foraging, so there was no uh, search uh, behavior. Um, but uh, we also uh, recorded while the animals were performing this sort of classic task where they had searched for um, a reward in one of the corners. Um, and this is just one of the uh, place fields. Uh, so as we saw before, in the rectangular chamber, uh, there are two possible place field uh, locations. Uh, we can then compare this to the uh, behavior of the animal. So here are the search locations of the animal. Uh, sometimes the animal searches in the correct corner. Uh, sometimes in the diagonally opposite corner, so they make a, a geometric error. Sometimes they make a non-geometric error, but not often. Um, and as you can sort of see here, there's a correspondence between the alignment of the hippocampal map and the behavior of the animal. So uh, when the map is aligned this way, the animal searches in the correct location. When the uh, hippocampal map is rotated, uh, the behavior of the animal uh, reflects that. So the animal searches uh, in the diagonal opposite of the corner. Um, and in fact, if we attempt to predict uh, the search location on individual trials uh, based on the hippocampal map uh, in, on that trial, uh, we find uh, that we can do about 75 80% accuracy. Okay. Not going to get into the details here. But. All right. So um, what I think these data indicate is that when the animals are placed back in the chamber, uh, they look out at the world um, and you know, do some perception of the world, and then they extract some representation of their orientation uh, relative uh, to the geometry of the chamber. Um, and then they use that to align their hippocampal map, which has a representation of the reward, um, and then controls their uh, you know, search behavior subsequent to that. And uh, if we think about what the equivalent might be for, say, uh, one of us walking around the city, uh, let's say we get lost, and we say, okay, where am I? We look at the visual scene, 
uh, we form some representation of our orientation relative to the geometry of the scene, which in this case is probably defined by the alignment of the street and the facade of the building. Um, and then we can use that to figure out how we're aligned in the broader environment. So this actually is the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, so if you're facing this facade, you must be facing two feet. Okay. So that brings us to the next question. Um, so I showed you um, that uh, the hippocampal map um, is aligned to geometry. And I'm postulating that in order to uh, make that alignment, you have to have this operation. You have to form a representation of your alignment relative local geometry. In other words, in order for me to figure out you know, where north is in this broader environment, which is over there, the first step I have to do is figure out how I'm aligned in this local environment, how I'm aligned relative to this scene. And then I can then use my knowledge of how this scene or this local environment is aligned relative to the rest of the world. Okay. So uh, next question is, you know, where does this happen in the brain? And you know, can we identify this mechanism in the brain? That's the second part of my talk. How do we establish a reference frame that is anchored to local scene geometry. Okay, and now I'm going to switch from rodents to uh, humans um, to answer this question. So, to answer this question, we actually need to look beyond the hippocampus uh, to the wider network of brain regions involved in spatial navigation. So, um, in this figure, I'm showing you uh, the results of a meta analysis of uh, 24 fMRI uh, studies uh, where people were put in the fMRI scanner and we're doing some kind of navigational task, navigating around in the video game environment or something like that. Um, and what you see here is that there's a network of regions that tend to be activated uh, during navigational tasks. Uh, this network includes the hippocampus and entorhinal cortex, which is good because that's where those plates and grid cells are. Um, but it's larger than that. We also uh, tend to see activation in the parahippocampal region, the retrosplenial cortex, and the parietal cortex. Okay. Um, and this is a sort of reliable result across studies. Um, so this is interesting to me because uh, this network of brain regions uh, overlaps quite a bit uh, with the set of brain regions uh, that tends to get activated, not when you're navigating, but when you're simply looking at navigationally relevant visual information. So if you just put people in that MRI scanner, um, show them uh, images, have them passively view images of different types of things, so like over on the left would be in the visual world called scenes, so landscapes, cityscapes, rooms, um, faces, objects, and whatnot. There are three regions of the brain that respond more strongly during viewing scenes than viewing of other interesting visual scenes. These are the retrosplenial complex, so this retrosplenial region, the parahippocampal place area, so that parahippocampal region and the third uh, region uh, back in the occipital lobe, known as the occipital place area. Um, indeed, I originally got interested in uh, navigation. I wasn't originally interested in navigation. I was originally interested in scene perception. Um, and so I started studying these regions, and then I started to realize they were interested, that they were involved in navigation, which is kind of where I've got to where I am now. OK, so these areas process uh, navigationally relevant visual information uh, including, so these are good candidates for uh, processing information about how you're oriented relative to the local environment. Okay. Now, I want to focus on the retrosplenial uh, region in particular, uh, because as you'll see, uh, this is going to be an especially important region uh, for uh, spatial reorientation. Uh, so this is what we call the retrosplenial complex in humans, activates in navigation studies and during passive viewing scenes retrospinial cortex and rodents. And on the right here, this is a figure from Kravitz and colleagues uh, showing uh, regions um, in the macaque uh, monkey and basically showing connectivity between uh, the parietal lobe and the medial temporal lobe. And what I like about this figure, I, here I've uh, highlighted the putative homologs of the retrospinial com complex, is it shows you that this retrospinial region is very nicely situated to mediate between the parietal lobe, where we know that there are egocentric representations of space, and the medial temporal lobe, where we know that there are allocentric representations of space. So, um, you know, and that's basically the transformation that you have to make when you spatially reorient yourself. Um, the importance of this region uh, for spatial reorientation is uh, further supported by the neuropsychology of literature. Um, so, when this area is damaged, uh, say due to stroke, you get fascinating deficit that has been labeled a heading disorientation. Um, so here is a case report from Eno and colleagues. Uh, they write that 
Um, on the evening of December 11, 2000, a 55 year old right handed man, so this is someone who I uh, realized later had a stroke in the, that affected his retrospinal region. Um, so he had a history of hypertension, who was working as a taxi cab driver in Kyoto City for 20 years, suddenly lost his knowledge of the route to his house while returning home from work. He could recognize buildings in the landscape and therefore understand uh, where he was, but the landmarks that he recognized did not provoke directional information about any other places with respect to these landmarks. Consequently, he could not determine which direction to proceed to go home. Um, so, you know, what's really remarkable about this syndrome, at least to me, is that, you know, this guy can look out and he can see all these buildings and can sort of see his surroundings and he can identify them. He can say what they are. Um, but they don't provoke directional information. It's like he can see and identify the landmarks, but he can't use them uh, to orient his cognitive map, to align his uh, cognitive map. Okay. Um, so uh, we thought this was intriguing, uh, so we wanted to use neuroimaging of normal, uh, non brain damaged uh, subjects to test the idea that this retrospinal region uh, is the area of the human brain that extracts your heading relative to the local environment in the service of reorientation. So to do that, we have to show uh, two things. First, that the retrospinal region uh, represents heading uh, when people are trying to spatially reorient themselves. <coughs> um, and second, that it codes that heading relative to local scene geometry. Um, to this end, uh, we designed a virtual environment uh, that was optimized for looking at different headings. So uh, here is an overhead schematic of the environment. Um, and the cover story here is that this is a park uh, that has four uh, museums uh, in it. Um, and the critical feature here is that all four of these museums have the same internal geometry, so they're all the same shape of a rectangle. Um, but they're laid out uh, facing different directions in the world. So, uh, for example, if you're in this museum and you're facing away from the door, uh, you're facing to the north. Uh, but if you leave that museum and go into this museum facing away from the door, is uh, facing uh, to the east. And as we'll see in a moment, uh, this design will allow us to identify heading codes uh, that are tied to local geometry. Um, I just want to show you what this environment looks like from ground level. Uh, so I have a little movie here. So here we are in the park. You can see uh, the museums. They're all very distinct from the outside, have different appearances. Here we're going to go inside the museum. Uh, and they all look very different on the inside, you know, different textures and materials and things like that. Although, as I mentioned, they're all the same overall shape, or rectangle overall. Okay. Now, it wouldn't be a museum if you didn't have something inside to look at. You have exhibits. Uh, so you can see here, uh, each museum had uh, eight exhibits. So let's zoom in on one. So here's an example. Um, so this is a lamp. Uh, so it's not very exciting. Museum, I guess. Um, and the, uh, and uh, each one of these exhibits uh, is, uh, as you can see, on one of these outcomes. And that turns out to be kind of important uh, because it means that to face this object, you must be facing a certain direction. So if you're facing the lamp, you are facing to the west. So before we scan people, uh, we need to teach uh, people the layout of this environment. Uh, so. Uh, we have a learning phase. Um, it consists of about 15 minutes of just navigating around, kind of like you're playing a video game, free navigation. Um, and uh, you know, during that phase, we just uh, told people be sure to go to uh, each one of the four museums at least once. Um, and then we had about uh, 45 minutes of guided learning in which they start out here and they're told to find one of the objects. They wander around until they find it. Uh, then they're asked to find another object. And this continues until they find each object twice. Uh, that takes about 45 minutes. Okay. And then once they have that knowledge, we then put them in the scanner, uh, and we want to see what parts of the brain are activated when they retrieve this knowledge. Okay. Uh, to get them to retrieve this knowledge in the scanner, we ask them to perform what's known as a judgment of relative direction task. Um, so in each trial, um, they're asked to imagine they're facing one of the objects, and then they're given a second object, and they have to say whether that object will be to the left or right from that point of view. Uh, so in this first trial, they have to imagine that they're facing the cake, and they have to say whether the bike would be to the left or right uh, from that position. Um, the critical aspect of this task um, is that it requires subjects to reinstantiate a spatial situation on each trial. So essentially, um, they're prompted uh, to 
reorient themselves on each trial. Okay. Um, and I want to emphasize here that the uh, only uh, thing that people actually see in the scanner are words. So they don't actually see this map or this uh, scene in the scanner. Um, although in subsequent uh, experiments, we found that we get very similar results if instead of using words to prompt uh, the new view, uh, we actually give them the scene. It doesn't seem to matter uh, you know, which uh, physical stimulus you use uh, to prompt a retrieval of the spatial information. You get similar results. Okay. Now, so we were interested in using fMRI signals to understand the nature of the information that's encoded in this region of the brain while subjects are performing this task. Um, to do this, we use a technique known as multivoxel pattern analysis, might be familiar to many of you, um, and that is based on the uh, fact that um, the fMRI signal is encoded in discrete elements known as voxels. So if you zoom in on RC here, you might see that it consists of about 50 100 voxels. So that means that you can look at the activation pattern across these uh, voxels in different conditions. So let's say this is the pattern when subjects are imagining uh, facing uh, object one, what we might call view one. Um, we can compare that to the pattern when the subject is imagining facing another object, view two. Uh, for simplicity, I will represent these patterns as one dimensional uh, vectors. Um, now, these are different objects, but in both cases, the subject is imagining themselves facing to the north. Um, so if there's some representation of heading in the retrosomal region, then uh, these patterns, activation patterns, should be similar to each other. Um, in contrast, if you compare a uh, pattern for view 1 to a pattern for, say, view 3, which is facing a different direction, these two patterns should be dissimilar from each other, if there's a representation of your imagined heading when you're performing this task. Uh, and in fact, the data uh, bears. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but I am curious what's on the email. That's all. I'll put it to the end of the talk. Okay. Um, if you just compare uh, views uh, within uh, a museum, um, we found that patterns for views facing the same direction are more similar to patterns facing different directions. So uh, views one and two elicit similar activation patterns, three and four. Five and six and seven and eight. Okay, so they're distinct activation patterns for different headings. So that shows that this region does encode heading during spatial re reorientation. Um, but it doesn't tell us the reference frame uh, that's uh, being used uh, to code heading. And there are at least two possibilities. Um, so one possibility is that heading is coded which globally, right, um, in this consistent way across all four museums across the entire environment. Um, now, we can potentially look at that by comparing uh, patterns across museums. So, if we have a global uh, representation of heading, then views 1 and 2 in this museum should give us similar patterns to views 15 and 16 in the other, both facing global north. Uh, the second possibility is that heading is coded relative to the local geometry. In this case, views 1 and 2 in this museum should give us similar patterns to 9 and 10. Because what you might call local north in this, this museum is this way, and local north in this museum is this way. Three and four should be similar to 11 and 12, and so on. Um, so we tested uh, you know, both of these uh, possibilities. Uh, what we found is that when we tested for a, a global uh, heading, uh, we didn't see any evidence uh, for that. Um, but when we compared, um, so we can cross that out. Uh, but when we tested for local uh, representation of heading, heading relative to local geometry, we strong, strong evidence of that. So uh, views facing the same local direction, so local north or local east, even if there are different museums, give you similar activation patterns. Um, so just to summarize that, uh, first, this shows that RSC codes heading during spatial reorientation. Uh, second, uh, we show that the heading represent representations generalize across environments with the same geometry. And this indicates the heading is coded relative to local uh, geometry. This seems to be uh, what we were uh, looking for. Okay. Um, and uh, just to make this really clear, um, this is just the data uh, plotted a different way. Um, so what I'm plotting here is um, the similarity of the pattern for the reference view, uh, which in this case I'm using this top left as the reference view, and the similarity uh, between that view and all 15 other views. And what you can see is that the view facing the same direction, both within the museum and across museums, 
are similar to the reference view. And although I'm just plotting this reference view here, I could plot this with any other reference view and see a similar thing. Okay. Um, now you might ask what's happening at the cellular level. Um, actually, I wasn't originally going to show this, um, you know, for time, but then I thought everyone has neurons. I better show something, you know, in the section that has a neuron, right? Um, so when we originally uh, published this paper, we actually didn't have any idea of what was going on at the cellular level. Uh, you know, there's some speculation in the paper, which is, you know, now I look back and it's kind of embarrassing. Uh, so if you ever publish a paper and you don't know what's happening at the, uh, at the neuronal level, you know, don't speculate, you'll be embarrassed later. Um, but um, uh, after we published the paper, uh, an interesting paper came out of King Jeffrey's lab that I think uh, provides a part of the answer. So this is a recording from retrospinal cortex in rodents. Um, in an environment, that, this two-chamber environment. Um, and as you can see, uh, these two uh, rectangular subchambers, what you can sort of see, are actually polarized opposite directions by a cue card on opposite ends. Um, and what they found when they recorded uh, from cells in the retrospinal cortex, well, some of the cells they found were what you might call classic head direction cells. Uh, so they fire in a given direction, and that direction is consistent across the two, two subchambers. Um, but intermixed with them, they found a new type of cell that they labeled bidirectional cells. And these cells are quite interesting because they might, one of them might fire in one direction, one sub subchamber, but then reverse and fire in the opposite direction in the other subchamber. So these cells seem to be represent, representing this sort of global uh, uh, heading across the entire environment, but these cells seem to be representing the alignment of each uh, subchamber, so the local uh, head. Um, and you know, I'm just putting this, uh, showing this here. Uh, you know, uh, in my after my analyses, um, I was uh, focusing on the retrospinal region. You might say, well, what happens in the rest of the brain? You know, maybe what you're finding is something that can be found in many different regions of the brain. Uh, this is just the result of a searchlight analysis looking for local heading. Uh, and what you, so this is. Uh, looking for this local heading without any regions of interest, you know, looking at any possible uh, no a priori anatomical hypothesis. And what you find is that uh, this code is really quite uh, localized. You find it in the retrospinal region, and just one other region uh, unexpectedly in the superior parietal lobe. But it's not like you get this local heading uh, representation in many areas of the brain, and you don't get it, for example, in the other scene selective regions like the parahippocampal place area or the occipital uh, place area. Five minutes? Oh, wow. Well. Okay. Um, all right. So, last section. How do we perceive the spatial structure of the local scene? Um, so now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Um, I've been talking about the overall structure of the scene, uh, you know, as defined by its shape. Um, but there's another aspect of the geometry of the scene uh, that uh, might be uh, interesting here. Um, and that is, uh, if you look at the scene like this one, uh, you can talk about you know, the boundaries of the scene, which define where you can't go, but the complementary aspect of the scene geometry is what we might call the navigational affordances of the scene, uh, which are basically where you can go, basically the pathways through the scene. So I'm going to tell you, if I have time, um, about an fMRI study uh, that uh, tried to get at this aspect of the scene geometry. Um, so to investigate this issue, we collected 50 uh, images of indoor environments. Uh, we quantified these navigational affordances uh, simply by having raters uh, map out the pathways through each scene. Um, and then if you average over raters, you get a map like this. Um, so this is where you can go in the scene. There's another example. There's another example. Um, and then we simply uh, quantify these maps by turning them into angular histograms. Um, and then uh, we created a stimulus to similarity uh, matrix um, that reflects um, how similar our 50 scenes are in terms of these uh, histograms. Uh, we then uh, presented these images to people in the scanner, uh, presented uh, one at a time. Um, and we gave them a task that didn't involve uh, really thinking about these affordances. In fact, their task was simply to view these scenes uh, and press a button whenever they saw a bathroom. You know, that's just to make sure that they're paying attention. Uh, we then analyzed uh, our fMRI data um, in terms of what's known as representational similarity analysis, and this is quite simple. We simply compare the stimulus, the similarity matrix uh, for affordances 
to this, uh, this uh, neural dissimilarity matrix, which is the similarity between multivoxel patterns within the region. So the idea is that if your brain region is uh, representing navigational affordances, then these two uh, matrices should look similar to each other. Okay. So what did we find? Well, we focused our analyses. In this case, we didn't know where we were going to find this information. So we focused on all three scene regions, the perihippocampal place area, the retrospinal complex, and the occipital place area, and also earlier visual cortex. And when we did this analysis, we found, somewhat to our surprise, we didn't know what we should expect, that there's a strong representation of this information up here uh, in the occipital place area. A little bit in the uh, parahippocampal place area, but the response in the OPA is significantly stronger uh, than the other three regions. And uh, this was actually borne out by a second version of the experiment, uh, where we used not real-world scenes, but artificial scenes that were completely uh, controlled for the shape of the room and the colors and textures. And here the affordances are defined simply by uh, where the exits are. Uh, and there we got similar results, even cleaner, uh, where we find that this navigational affordance uh, information uh, is uh, represented um, solely in the uh, OPA. Um, and uh, you know, if you do this analysis across the entire brain, the occipital place area is the only area where you see this uh, navigational uh, affordance uh, information. Um, and so this is one type of geometry, it's not the type of geometry I was talking about in the first part of the talk, um, but in fact, um, other data suggests that the OPA might be generally involved in uh, processing the geometry of the scene in terms of not only uh, its navigational forces, but uh, also uh, its shape. Um, and I'm sort of zooming because I have, what, two minutes? Okay, okay, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll be done in like five minutes. Um, and of course, you know, we thought that was really intriguing, uh, you know, but we were a little puzzled. It's like, you know, navigational affordances are the sort of seem like this sort of high level thing. The OPA is a visual region. You know, how do you calculate these sorts of things? Uh, to get some traction on this problem, uh, we used, uh, I guess, sort of the favorite tool of uh, visual computational neuroscientists now, a convolutional neural network. Um, uh, this was a network that was actually uh, trained uh, on scene categorization. Um, you know, to, it takes a scene like this one and tells you, oh, this is a kitchen or this is a bathroom or something like that. Um, and we uh, looked to see if there was uh, any evidence uh, for this uh, representational space of affordances in the layers of this uh, neural network. Um, and what we found was that, you know, even though the neural network is not trained on navigational affordances, uh, you find some correlation between the representational space uh, in particularly uh, layer 5, the last convolutional uh, layer of the uh, network, and uh, this affordance space. So there's some information. This network is extracting some kind of features that are potentially useful uh, for uh, calculating navigational affordances. And just to figure out uh, what these are, uh, we used a, um, a visualization uh, procedure uh, where we took our images, passed them through the CNN, and then would take a version of the image that's included, pass it through the CNN. And then for each unit in the CNN, you can say, okay, uh, you know, where in the image, uh, where do you get a certain discrepancy? Where, where can you place this occluder to get a discrepancy? And that gives you sort of a receptive field uh, for the unit uh, in the image. Um, and if you pick uh, units in uh, the CNN that have information about the navigational affordances, and you look at the receptive fields, you find something quite interesting, and that is uh, that it seems like uh, these units are responding to junctions between large planes. Um, and that's going to be an uh, information that's going to be useful for figuring out where to go in the scene and what is the shape of the scene. Okay. Uh, so to summarize, um, I've shown you that uh, the cognitive maps supported by place cells in the road hip campus, the length, local geometry, and spatial reorientation. Uh, I showed you that the retrospinal region <coughs> is the location relative to local geometry. And I showed you that uh, the occipital place area extracts uh, spatial features of the local scene, which might provide the perceptual inputs to the system. So, I mean, this is only part of the uh, story, but I think what this shows you is that, you know, we can uh, begin to map out the circuit uh, for spatial uh, reorientation. Um, and I was going to tell you to talk a little bit about this idea about what a cognitive map is anyway, 
but I think for time, I'll just uh, sort of leave that uh, for discussion. Okay. Thank you.